You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-696-1030. Again, 800-696-1030. That's 800-696-1030. 800-696-1030. Joe had huge problems with the IRS. I knew it was coming. I hadn't filed taxes since 1990. All the IRS letters coming in added up to a nightmare. It got up to like $68,000. My heart started beating fast. It's like, there's no way, man. I mean, I ain't going to be able to do this. Then they stopped his paycheck. So that's when I started making phone calls and found U.S. Tax Shield. U.S. Tax Shield went to work immediately. They just took the bull by the horns. What blew my mind is he called the IRS right then and there. So why is U.S. Tax Tax Shield A plus rated with the Better Business Bureau? Joe knows. They saved me a ridiculous amount of money. If you owe more than ten thousand dollars to the IRS or state, choose the company Joe chose. U.S. Tax Shield. It was the best decision I made. U.S. Tax Shield is the way to go. Life is good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Call eight hundred four seven one thirty two eighty seven. U.S. Tax Shield. Boo raw. Yes. <laughs> 800-471-3287. 800-471-3287. The Internet will never be the same. You're listening to K98talk.com. It's time now for the Conservative Curmudgeon Radio Show on K98 Talk. Now, here's Grouchy. Good evening, everybody. So glad to have you back with us on Wednesday night on K98. Uh, tonight, you get me. Then you get a nice break. There's a little gap, about two hours in the middle, and then you get the rowdy one, Rick Robinson, uh, in the 10 o'clock hour, uh, for those of you in the central time zone, 11 o'clock for those of you on the East Coast. Uh, why is it set up that way? Well, we we know. We talked about it last week. Yeah, there's just some acts you can't follow, and yeah, well, you know. Anyway, um, that, that'd be because I can't go three hours. Um, <laughs> anyway... Um, so glad you're here tonight. We got a great deal of stuff to it talk about. It is open, though, if you decide you ever want to do that, just saying. <laughs> yeah, there's the invite to go back to a longer show. I think we tried that once, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, you made it for about a month before you decided it was a little hard to keep going for two hours. It, uh, you know, it was it was really difficult. I have to admit that uh, coming up with enough material for two hours was not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but, um, it, it's not that it can't be done. It's just the time that it consumes 
And I just, I really don't have that time to give, but there may come a day again, you never know. So anyway, um, we're gonna start the night off and we're going to, uh, we're gonna look back a little bit at uh, Associate uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, who just passed recently. Uh, he was serving on the Supreme Court, 79 years old. Judge Scalia is such a, it's a hard, hard thing to describe. He's one of the most intelligent legal minds that you will have ever come across. Um, you can read it in his dissenting opinions. You can read it in uh, his, uh, any opinion, dissenting or otherwise. But what I remember most about Judge Scalia was a case that the Supreme Court heard, and he uttered this very simple question. Um, and it just, it set me back when I heard him ask this question. And I thought to myself, I don't know how a lawyer answers that and, and actually convinces this panel of judges that it's different or better or worse. Now, what was this very simple question? Justice Scalia, and we're going to go into it a little more in detail here. Um, this goes back to the year 2003 when the court heard Lawrence v. Texas. And at question here uh, was this. Is there a constitutionally protected right to same-sex sodomy and are states therefore barred from prohibiting it? Now, essentially, the same question had come before the court in 1986 in the case of Bowers v. Hardwick. And then Justice Byron White, a John F. Kennedy appointee, wrote in that it was not unconstitutional for states to prohibit sodomy. Opponents had argued that such laws violate the 14th Amendment, which says, Quote, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. They argued that sodomy was a fundamental right and therefore a liberty protected by this language. White and four other justices did not agree. The issue presented, said this JFK appointee, Justice White, is whether the federal constitution offers a fundamental right upon homosexuals to engage in sodomy and hence invalidates the laws of many states that still make such conduct illegal and have done so for a very long time. The case also calls for some judgment about the limits of the court's role in carrying out its constitutional mandate. What the majority saw in Bowers was a court moving to usurp a power that it did not legitimately have. Seventeen years later, when Lawrence came before the Supreme Court, Scalia apparently saw the same problem and framed around the same issue. So Scalia put the question to the lawyer, then arguing that the court should declare sodomy a constitutionally protected right, why is it different from bigamy? Why is it different from bigamy? Just a simple little question. So simple. In part of his answer, the lawyer tried to draw a distinction between the type of behavior and the institution of marriage, which he described as an institution, quote, the state creates. 
Now, obviously, uh, he didn't know a whole lot about marriage because marriage is not an institution that the state creates. Marriage is an institution that God created and that the states became involved in when they saw a way to make money off of it. Now, the lawyer said, according to the transcript of the oral argument, bigamy involves protection of an institution that the state creates for its own purposes, and there are all sorts of potential justifications about the need to protect the institution of marriage that are different in kind from the justifications that could be offered here involving merely a criminal statute that says we're going to regulate these people's behaviors. In Lawrence, the court's majority did rule that same-sex sodomy was protected by the 14th Amendment and overruled state laws prohibiting it. In dissent, Scalia pointed to where this is going. Now listen to this, because this is so brilliant. And think about what's happening today. Scalia wrote, quote, The Texas statute undeniably seeks to further the belief of its citizens that certain forms of sexual behavior are immoral and unacceptable. The same interest furthered by criminal laws against fornication, bigamy, adultery, adult incest, bestiality, and obscenity, wrote Scalia. Bowers held that this was a legitimate state interest. The court today reaches the opposite conclusion. If, as the court asserts, the promotion of maturation, sexual morality, is not even a legitimate state interest, none of the above-mentioned laws can survive rational basis review, said Scalia. Twelve years later, the court had declared same-sex marriage a constitutional right. In his dissent in Obergfell v. Hodges, Scalia argued that under the Constitution, as correctly understood, the people could decide through their state governments to approve or not approve same-sex marriage, but the court had usurped that power and more. Today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of the nine lawyers of the Supreme Court, said Scalia. This practice of constitutional revision by an unelected committee of nine, always accompanied, as it is today, by extravagant praise of liberty, he said, robs the people of the most important liberty they asserted in the Declaration of Independence and won in the Revolution of 1776, the freedom to govern themselves. This man was brilliant beyond belief. A majority of the court has said that individuals have a right to kill unborn babies but that the majority of a state does not have the right to prohibit two people of the same sex from marrying. The court is now poised to decide whether Catholic nuns, despite their First Amendment right and the free exercise of religion, can be forced to act against that religion in providing health insurance that covers abortion-inducing drugs. Unfortunately, we will not get to see Justice Scalia offer his next dissent over what could be the unelected committee of nine that now revises our Constitution. Judge Scalia will be sorely, sorely missed. And I do believe that... Uh, we have an audio clip of Judge Scalia that I'd like to go ahead and play if we could, Mr. Producer. Yep, one second. 
Yep. This is going to be Judge Scalia addressing a uh, graduation ceremony. And, and listen to his words because they are so soaked in wisdom and riches. Nobody ever proposed evil as such. Neither Hitler nor Lenin nor any other desperate you, you can name ever came forward with a proposal that read, let's create a really oppressive and evil society. Rather, Hitler said, let's take the means necessary to restore our national pride and civic order. And Lenin said, let's take the means necessary to assure a fair distribution of the goods of the world. In short, it is your responsibility, women of the class of 2015, not just to be zealous in the pursuit of your ideals, but to be sure that your ideals are the right ones, not merely in their ends, but in their means. That is perhaps the hardest part of being a good human being. Good intentions are not enough. Being a good person begins with being a wise person. Then. When you follow your conscience, you will be heading in the right direction. Now, this can be very good or very bad advice, depending on who you think you are. <laughs> Indeed, follow your star if you want to head north, and it's the North Star. But if, you want, if, but if you want to head north, and it's Mars, you had better follow somebody else's star. Indeed, never compromise your principles, unless, of course, your principles are Adolf Hitler's. In which case, you would be well advised to compromise them as much as you can. And indeed, to thine own self be true, depending on who you think you are. It, it, is, it is a belief today that seems particularly to beset modern society, that believing deeply in something, Following that belief is the most important thing a person can do. Get out there and pick it, or boycott, or electioneer, or whatever. Show yourself to be a, quote, committed person. That is, that is the fashionable phrase. I am here to tell you that it is much less important how committed you are than what you are committed to. If I had to choose, I would always take the less dynamic Indeed, even the lazy person who knows what's right, rather than the zealot in the, cause, in the cause of error. He may move slower, but he's headed in the right direction. Okay. Truer words may never have been spoken. Justice Scalia left us after 79 years on this earth. And not that I would wish death upon anybody, but it seems an injustice considering others on the court that have lived longer and don't have anywhere near the intelligence. But anyway, uh, we're going to, we're going to press on. Um, Justice Scalia will be sorely missed uh, by anybody with a brain. Anybody with a brain. So anyway, we're going to press on. Um, uh, enough of the, the mushy, sentimental type stuff. Um, we got to talk about Russia. Uh, and I know, uh, nobody really wants to talk about Russia. I, face it, they still suck. No matter how you slice it, going back to the Glasnost days, when, when Reagan basically ended the Cold War, pounded Russia into submission, Russia still sucks. So, as Russia again dismisses accusations that its air force is bombing hospitals in Syria, a new report by an independent human rights group said that Russia's supposed anti-Islamic state air campaign was responsible for more civilian deaths last month than either the Assad regime or ISIS. 
of the 1,382 civilians killed in January, 679 were killed in Russian strikes, including 94 children and 73 women. And this is according to the Syrian Network for Human Rights, which says it documents records with victims' names where possible from a network of activists across the country. Over the same period, regime forces killed 516 civilians, including 83 children and 69 women, and ISIS killed 98 civilians, including one child and 21 women. Oh, this is, again, according to SNHR, which is a uh, Syrian group. And they reported that armed opposition groups killed 42 civilians, including nine children and 10 women, while, quote unquote, unidentified groups killed another 41, including 12 children and 11 women. The Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, Jabhat el-Nursa and Kurdish groups killed three civilians each. The greatest loss of life attributed to Russia in January, uh, 226 deaths were recorded in Dire Azor province in central Syria, followed by 212 in Aleppo, the site of a major offensive by Russian-backed regime and Iranian forces. SNHR charged that the Assad regime and Russian forces had violated the principles of the human rights international laws, which protect the rights to life. Now let's just stop there for a second. Is it really a shock that <laughs> Russian-backed regime and Iranian forces violated the principles of human rights according to international law? Isn't this kind of what they've been doing over there? Uh, Russia for, what, the last, I don't know, 60, 70 years? And uh, as far as the uh, Middle Eastern countries that are largely Islamic, uh, they've pretty much been violating anything that resembles a human right going back 4,000 years at a minimum. Um. So, I mean, really, uh, people report this like they're aghast of it. And anyway, they, uh, they added that uh, evidence and eyewitness accounts indicated that more than 90% of the attacks targeted civilians and civilian areas, that this was not just collateral where there were civilians gathered around military targets. On Monday... At least four hospitals and two schools were reported to have been hit in airstrikes in northern Syria, with a total of at least 46 people killed and dozens more wounded. And this is according to the UN and the charity uh, Medicines Sans Frontiers, which supports one of the destroyed hospitals. And that would be like the uh, French version of Doctors Without Borders. Uh, you know, they just... Ha uh ha! -huh. We are doctors with no borders. Very good. Anyway, the Kremlin uh, on Tuesday denied the claims uh, that it targeted hospitals, a war crime under international law, if deliberate, uh, with spokesman uh, Dmitry Peskov saying that those who come up with such charges prove unable to somehow confirm their groundless accusations. And uh, in rebuttal, uh, you know, Bill Clinton said, hey, y'all got any chicks over there that need some one-on-one -on -one attention? I'd be happy to come over. Peskov said the Syrian government should be relied upon as the root source for any such intelligence and allegations and noted that Syria's ambassador to Moscow earlier blamed the U.S.-led coalition. A coalition spokesman said the nearest airstrike came carried out by coalition warplanes on Monday was 300 kilometers away from the closest of the four hospitals hit. In a separate re recent report, 
report, SNHR, said that since Russia began its air campaign in Syria last September, it has recorded at least 15,027 civilian deaths resulting from airstrikes. By comparison, the monitoring group said airstrikes by the U.S.-led International Coalition, which have been carried out for 12 months longer than the Russian campaign, have cost the lives of 267 civilians. All right, let's stop here for a second, okay? Um, they're, they're really comparing apples to oranges here. Um, and I'm going to get a little nitpicky. Um, have U.S.-led and I, I use that term very loosely um, because we haven't had anything resembling leadership in our government for seven years now. Um, the U.S.-led coalition may have been in place for 12 months longer than the Russian campaign, but the Russians have already launched more sorties, more individual sorties than the U.S.-led coalition has uh, since the beginning. So it does stand a reason that there would be a difference um, of something. You know, I'm not saying that it's justified. No, not at all. But I, I am wanting to point out here that the Russians have been far, far more aggressive than the U.S.-led coalition has. Um you know, Obama's rules of engagement leave a lot to be desired. They leave our fighting men and women helpless on a daily basis over there. Uh, you want to talk about uh, a war crime. <laughs> he's he's basically guilty of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, treason. Uh, what else? Uh, sedition. I, you know, he's, he's, he's sacrificing our men and women over there. Uh, in the name of building a legacy for himself over here, uh, a, a false legacy, but a legacy nonetheless. That's what he's after. He he wants to be lovingly remembered as as a as the real kinder and gentler president, if you will, to steal a phrase. Um. So, even though they believe that it is not enough. Uh, International coalition forces admit to making some mistakes regarding shelling incidents. It also conducted some investigations. But in contrast, Russian authorities categorically deny any killing or shelling incident and falsely accuse SNHR of fabricating this information or any shelling incidents perpetrated by its ally, the Syrian Assad regime. The Russian military has repeatedly rejected allegations by Western governments, humanitarian agencies, and parties on the ground that civilians are being killed in its operation, which Moscow claims is directed against ISIS and Jabhat al-Nursa. But the U.S. contends it is also targeting non-ISIS, non-Jabhat al-Nursa rebel groups opposed to President Assad. In a statement Tuesday, Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konashenkov repeated those denials and accused Turkey. Hospital attacks of having launched, quote, an aggressive information campaign against Russia in a bid to prevent losing control over northern and northwestern Syria. It is to be reminded one more time that the Russian armed forces jointly with the partners, with the partners, is that what he really said? Uh, that means Assad, by the way, have deployed a multi-level reconnaissance system which provides acquisition of true information 24 hours a day concerning the activities of terrorists on the territory of Syria and some of the country's neighbors. This is Konashenkov saying that, by the way. Uh, all the strikes on the terrorist objects are carried out only after multiple checks of the received data and coordination of actions to exclude risks for civilians. 
The state news agency, Itar Tas, said Tuesday that since Russia, la uh, that since Russia last September launched 30 pinpoint strikes against terrorists in Syria, it has targeted military hardware, communications centers, transport vehicles, munitions depots, and other terrorist infrastructure facilities. Well over 250,000 people have been killed in the five-year civil war, and at least 11 million have been displaced. So here we go, folks. We have the U.S.-led coalition and some either UN or US sponsored Syrian groups that are information gathering over there accusing Russia. We have Russia accusing Turkey. We have Assad accusing the US. And all the while our more than useless Secretary of State John Kerry has been trying to negotiate a ceasefire, if you will. And we are at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to burn a commercial break here. And when we come back, we're going to dive a little more into the ceasefire and see what's going on with that. And don't forget oh, to do 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 My bad. We will never fully understand what we've asked of our military service members or their families, asking them to put themselves in harm's way, to endure it all. But we do understand that it's our turn, our duty, to keep them secure for the rest of their lives. Wounded Warrior Project long-term support programs help our most severely ill or injured veterans live independently, at no cost for life, so that they might stand at ease. Join us at findwwp.org. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street casino and how to get the money you need when you need it simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com. All right, guys, we're ready for our Four Seasons sunroom, and Daddy's going to get a rec room with refreshments. Oh, no, we'll be sleeping under the stars. Mom, what about the one with, you know, the fun? Nice try, little bro. It's a gym, my gym. Hey, Grandma's getting her Four Seasons garden room, weather tight and still like being outdoors. Maybe a living room. Oh, no, wait, a family hub. Yeah. yeah. No matter what the budget, the season, or the climate, Four Seasons Sunrooms let you and your family enjoy the outdoors inside. Call now to receive your free, no-obligation brochure from the premier manufacturer of sunrooms since 1975. More reasons for Four Seasons Now. To find out more, call toll-free 800-928-7007. That's 800-928-7007. Call 800-928-7007 today. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk 
and the Spark Radio Network. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I'm feeling good tonight. I think I want to break some more glass. Let me get my intern over here. Hold up the window for me. Get get another piece of glass. Everybody say hi to Ivan, the intern over here. Yeah. Get the glass up. Okay, here we go. Here comes the ball. All right. We're good. So when we left, um, we were talking about uh, John Kerry negotiating this a uh, quote unquote, cessation of hostilities between the Obama administration, Russia, and other countries invested in the Syrian civil war. Uh, It's drawing sharp criticism uh, from analysts who argue that it will simply allow Moscow and its ally in Damascus to consolidate their gains at the expense of the opposition, which the U.S. is trying to support. Doesn't that sound familiar? The Obama administration giving away gains for what? To just give it away. After a meeting of the International Syria Support Group in Munich last week, Secretary of State John Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov announced an agreement to implement a nationwide cessation of hostilities to begin in a target of one week's time. But Lavrov made it clear that the fiercely contested region around Aleppo, Syria's largest city, was excluded from this agreement on the grounds that it is occupied by, quote, illegal armed groups. In what experts say may be a turning point in the civil war in favor of President Bashir al-Assad, regime forces backed by Russian airstrikes and by Shiite fighters from Iran, Iraq, and Lebanon have made significant gains in recent weeks around Aleppo, parts of which are effectively under siege. Russia contends that the targets in Aleppo are the al-Qaeda-affiliated Jabhat al-Nursa and its allies, terrorists. But also present in the area are, uh, present in the area are opposition forces not linked to Jabhat al-Nursa, which the U.S. supports as part of its campaign against uh, ISIS. Yeah, they almost got me there. <laughs> they tried to word it out, but <laughs> I don't say the word with the L in it because we know what that means. And if you don't know what that means, catch me on Twitter. Uh, You can just ask me out there. I'm not going to go into it here. But anyway, um, experts say that Russia is targeting moderate groups opposed to the regime using the cover of a supposedly anti-Jabat al-Nursa, anti-ISIS air campaign. And the limited truce announced by Kerry and Lavrov, they argue, will make things worse. Well, what did you expect with John Kerry involved in the in the negotiations? Look at the nuclear uh, negotiations that went on with Iran. Come on. Did anybody really expect that we were going to buckle down and get tough with these people? Hell no. Hell no, we're not. That's not Obama's style. He only gets tough with uh, people here in the U.S. where he can bully you legally. So the cessation of hostilities declared on February 11th permits Russia and the Assad regime to continue targeting U.S. allies in Aleppo under the pretext that the opposition in the city consists predominantly of al-Qaeda affiliate Jabhat al-Nursa. And this is from uh, Jennifer Jennifer Caffarella of the Institute of the Study of War. I've never heard of them. That's interesting. Uh, The Russian view of the situation in Aleppo is false and deliberately distorting. There are multiple opposition groups within Aleppo that are distinct from Jabhat al-Nursa, do not share its vision, and which the United States must support and strengthen, she wrote. Caffarella said Russia's main goal 
is to destroy these groups, some of which receive U.S. support that pose the greatest threat to Assad under the guise of targeting terrorists. The cessation agreement, therefore, is not a solution to the challenges the U.S. faces in Syria, she argued. It is a submission to Russia's agenda. Who said that? Wow. That grouchy guy, he might know what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, where, where did he leave off? Um, yeah, he may know what he's talking about, but he gets lost, too. Uh, American Enterprise Institute scholar Frederick Kagan and ISW President Kimberly Kagan, hmm, so the same way. I think they might be related to Yeah, maybe. Call the truce agreement a big win for Russia and the Assad regime. Of course, because John Kerry negotiated it. Christ, don't you people listen. Russia, Iran, and Syria are in the midst of a major military offensive that has allowed them to besiege Aleppo and has poised them to make gains across the battlefield. This so-called ceasefire agreement allows them to consolidate and prepare for further advances while preventing the opposition that the U.S. Uh, basically supports from attempting to undo any of their gains. How convenient. How freaking convenient. As such, they argue, the agreement will further alienate uh, uh, the very opposition groups whose support is needed for a political settlement of the Civil War in line with the U.S. national security interests. Don't you know that Obama doesn't care about that anymore? He has what, 10 and a half months left in office? He doesn't care. He's looking at the White House right now. He and, and Michelle are looking at the White House and they're thinking to themselves, remember what Hillary did when they left the first time? Wonder what we can take and get away with. Ah, come on, you know they're thinking it. Who cares, right? Who cares? They, they, they don't place any value in any of the true Americana that goes into the White House. So what could they possibly take from it that would be worth something? If they want to make the White House, uh, or, or if they'd like to increase the value of the White House, the best thing they could do is just leave. Diplomacy in the service of military aggression. Think about that while I read on. Criticism also comes from the Washington Post editorial board. Ooh, they're so vicious. Which said the administration had weakly agreed to a bad deal that will allow the Russian Iranian Assad forces to consolidate and expand on their gains. So they basically said the same thing that ISW said. Um, yeah, and to occupy a commanding position in any negotiation about Syria's future. Some of the strongest uh, criticism of the cessation of hostilities agreement, oh yeah, get, get this, came from Senator John McCain, uh, chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and a longstanding critic of Moscow. Yes, because he still thinks they're called the Soviet Union. Um, not, that, not that Putin wouldn't like to put the Union back together, but yeah, they're, they're not that anymore. So anyway, um, speaking Sunday in Munich, where he and Kerry both attended a security conference, McCain declared himself skeptical based on his view of Russian President Vladimir Putin's regional ambitions and the realities of power in the world today. McCain said it was no accident that Putin has now agreed to a quote-unquote ceasefire. We've seen this before in the Ukraine. Russia presses its advantages militarily, creates new facts on the ground, uses the denial and delivery of humanitarian aid as a bargaining chip, negotiates an agreement to lock in the spoils of war, 
and then chooses when to resume fighting, McCain said. Okay, I'm going to give him some credit for that. He's pretty much spot on. Um, you know, the big problem here isn't that we don't know what Russia's doing. We know what Russia does. We know what Russia has always done. The biggest problem we have is that uh, we have a panty waist in chief in the White House that is uh, just too afraid to pull the damn trigger and do what needs to be done. Because he would rather sit down over chocolate chip cookies and milk and, and negotiate all of his advantage away. Because to him, that's the art of politics. But then, you know, what do you get from a guy who voted president 156 times in two years in the Senate uh, before becoming president of the United States, where he's done nothing but just been a straight-up activist, forget being a leader. Uh, he's nothing but a liberal activist, socialist liberal activist. Anyway, uh, enough ranting about that moron. I mean, that guy, uh, oh, okay, we'll, we'll go with moron. Um, back to this. Uh, this is diplomacy in the service of military aggression. Remember, we read that up top, and I told you to think about that. So this is, this is where that comes in. And it is working because we are letting it work. The only deterrence that we seem to be establishing is over ourselves, said McCain. But he hoped that he was wrong. He said, I want to be wrong. Because if this agreement turns out to reward aggression rather than punish it, if it comes to be seen as a further embodiment of Western weakness and not strength, if it depends on the perception among our allies and partners in the Middle East that we are untrustworthy and uh, feckless, then not only will this agreement fail, but the war in Syria will grind on more innocent people will die. Western credibility and influence will diminish. The refugees will continue to flow out. The terrorists will continue to flow in and out. And our citizens will be attacked or attacked again. I don't often agree with a lot of John McCain. Quite frankly, I think he blew his opportunity at being the president I, I think that if he had, at the very first debate when he ran, in the primaries even, in the primaries, if he had driven up to the stage on his Harley, and yes, he did have a Harley. I don't know if he still has it, but he did have one. If he had driven up to the stage on his Harley, walked up to the podium, and turned around and scolded the other Republicans for being spineless and feckless and told them they didn't understand a damn thing because they don't know what it's like to go into combat for their country, kicked the podium over, got on his Harley, and then drove away, the American people would have rallied behind McCain and he would have become president because people relate to that. Is it childish? Yeah, it's childish. Is it showboaty? Yeah, it's showboaty. Is it running off at the mouth more than you should? Absolutely. But look what's going on right now in the primaries. You think that doesn't work with Americans? <laughs> Folks, I got news for you. There is a huge ignorant electorate out there, and they swarm behind that kind of stuff, which is why Trump's numbers are where they are. Trump appeals to the ignorant electorate in this country. And no, I'm not trying to be mean. I have friends online that are Trump supporters. I don't know why. They won't listen to facts. Ben uh, him does. He's not my guy. Okay? But I get why they're pissed off at government. I get why they hate D.C. and how it functions. But anyway, just make a little correlation there. So 
Uh, let me select the notes are out of order because I did slip first here. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to do this. We got to do this. Um, so we got Homeland uh, Security Secretary uh, Jeff Johnson said last week that the Obama administration is trying to make it easier for individuals from Central America to gain refugee status in the United States in response to the ongoing surge of unaccompanied alien children and families entering the country illegally in recent years. Slam on the freaking brakes. These morons already know that we're spending over a trillion dollars a year already, already on illegal aliens and they want to make it easier for them to get here. <sighs> Johnson said, we are preparing to offer vulnerable individuals fleeing the violence in Central America a safe and legal alternate path to a better life. I think I'm going to puke. We're expanding our refugee admissions program to help vulnerable men, women, and children in Central America who qualify as refugees. We are partnering with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and non-governmental organizations in the region to do this as soon as possible. So basically what they want to change the requirement to for refugee status is if you can make it to the United States border and say, refugee, you're in. And if you're too young to know how to say the word refugee, all you have to do is make some kind of noise and they'll say you said it. So this approach uh, builds on their recently established Central American Miners Program, uh, which is now providing an in-country refugee processing option for certain children with lawfully present parents in the United States. I got news for you. They don't really care if the parents are here in the United States or not, legal or not. They simply do not care. The UN praised the program when it was announced in January and issued a press release that said although the US should be able to control its border, the best interest of the children should be considered. How thoughtful of them to acknowledge that we should be able to control our borders. Somebody needs to quote and frame that so that when we actually find somebody that's willing to control our borders and they start condemning us for it, we can beat them over the head with it. Now UNHCR recognizes that it is the prerogative of the states to manage in the security of their borders, uh, the press relief uh, said. However, the return of persons deemed not to be in need of international protection should take place only after their claims have been considered through due process. Well, that's kind of hard to do when 96% of them don't show up at court for their legal status hearings, isn't it? Moreover, any such returns must be carried out in a manner that is orderly, safe, and respectful of the dignity of the individuals and families concerned. Yes, because their dignity is what they're considering as they slop through the uh, fecal-infested waters uh, of the rivers that are on the border in the South to get to the United States, right? Uh, in particular... Returns of unaccompanied or separated children must be based on a determination of what is the best interest of the child. Uh, I can tell you right now, it's to send them home. Because if their parents aren't here, they're there. So get them out of here. The, uh, blah, 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 blah. According to DHS Customs and Border Protection, the number of unaccompanied alien children entering the U.S. is up 102% in fiscal year 2016 over the same period, which would be the first quarter of 2015. 102%. We covered these numbers last week. If you weren't with me, uh, real quick, uh, a year ago, first quarter, 10,105 unaccompanied alien children, 100, I'm sorry, 10,105 
unaccompanied illegal alien children, and yes, they are illegal. This year, same time period, 20,455. The number of family units represents the number of individuals, either a child under 18 years old, parent or legal guardian, apprehended with a family member by CBP, increased 171% in the same time frame last year, 9,090 in three months versus 24,616, same three months this year. They're doing a bang-up job, aren't they? Anyway, like Jay Johnson knows what he's talking about. Um, we need to, um, yeah, here we go. Um, Mr. Producer, get ready. Uh, we're going we're gonna to cue that other audio here in just a second. Uh, yesterday on the campaign trail, Hillary Clinton went on a riff about how wonderful it would be if there were such a thing as a real-time political fact-checking mechanism that would sound an alarm every time Republicans say something false. And what, what she suggested the alarm sounds like is this. Oh, 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 oh. I, really? She wants a dog barking every time that a Republican says something false. Well, how about every time something Hillary says something false? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, it garnered a little laugh from her audience. Um, but, you know, here's I, I'm convinced that this sort of running truth detector would not benefit her at all. Uh, given the frequency and effortlessness of her own lies, uh, for instance, the one example she offered of Republican dishonesty was itself inaccurate. Uh, Republicans accurately say that one of the biggest causes of the Great Recession was too little government regulation, not too much. In any case, Hillary uncorked a tweet storm last night personally firing off and signing 11 consecutive tweets excoriating the GOP for its decision to deny President Obama the opportunity to replace Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. Her stream of partisanship includes some telling omissions and falsehoods. So let's take a look at them. Uh, it garnered a laugh from our audience. Yeah, we know that part. Yeah. So anyway, uh, here we go. Tweet one. It is the job of President of the United States to nominate Supreme Court justice. It is right there in the Constitution. She signed it. Well, yes, it is in the Constitution. But he's disputing that. At least I haven't heard anybody do that. Uh, the Constitution also grants the United States Senate the power to withhold its consent presidential nomination. This is called checks and balances. Hillary should get used to that in case the inevitable doesn't happen and somebody doesn't kick her fat ass and she ends up in the White House. God help us. So, um, Congress's upper chamber has seen fit to do so many times uh, over the history of our republic. For reasons we'll get into below, there is zero doubt that Hillary Clinton is keenly aware of the legislative branch's constitutional authority within this process. Mrs. Clinton proceeds to run through a series of major cases on the court's docket on issues ranging from immigration to abortion. Uh, her hope, by the way, is that SCOTUS will uphold Obama's unlawful executive amnesty. So pressing on, uh, some of the other tweets, um, here's Hillary. With these critical cases in balance, Republicans wasted no time in vowing to block any SCOTUS nomination from POTUS, a new low. Then the next one, I have news for Republicans who would put politics over the Constitution. 
Refusing to do your duty isn't righteous. It's disgraceful. Um, yeah, let's examine those two together because real quick here, uh, it was Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama who filibustered President Bush's last Supreme Court pick. She also joined obstructionist Senate Democrats in filibustering a host of Bush nominees to crucial appeals court seats, including a top flight Hispanic nominee named Miguel Estrada, who was held in limbo for two years before finally withdrawing. Back then, Hillary and her allies framed the act of denying Bush's his selections as the fulfillment of a righteous duty. Only righteous Democrats do it. Hillary, bitch. Uh, now that the shoe's on the other foot, it's a giant disgrace, according to her. But that wasn't enough. She kept going. I have news for Republicans who would put politics over the Constitution. Oh, she repeated herself. Okay, so we'll skip that one. Uh, then, okay, there are 339 days until the next president takes office. The Senate has never taken more than 125 days to vote on a SCOTUS nominee. Well, that's true. They've never taken more than 125 days to vote. But actually, back in the mid-1800s, when President Tyler sat in office, he had two Supreme Court justices that he was trying to fill the seats of. One vacancy lasted 450 plus days, and the other one lasted 852 days. Now, did they vote? Yeah, they voted. The Senate voted to turn him down on his nominations. It's not unheard of. There is plenty of precedent. Hillary continued, asked for complaints that this is an election year. 1988 was an election year also, and Justice Kennedy was confirmed 97 to nothing. This tweet counts on readers' ignorance regarding that confirmation fight. The vacancy in question opened up in 1987, not an election year, obviously, and President Reagan selected conservative stalwart Robert Bork to ascend to the court. The ensuing confirmation battle spanned five months, ending in a defeat spearheaded by Democrats who used scorched earth tactics and extreme de uh, demagoguery to vilify Bork. Uh, you know, basically he had a shameful affair uh, and, and blah, blah, blah. Kennedy was Reagan's eventual consensus pick offered in the face of intransigent, obstinate opposition. The reality is that for more than 80 years, the Senate has not confirmed a Supreme Court appointment to a seat that came open during a presidential election year. Boom. Hillary. Sounds like uh, I hear a dog barking again, maybe. But the New York Times editorial board, meanwhile, is doing its best, engaging in transparency and partisan hackery on behalf of the Democrats. The Times editors are furious with Republicans for vowing to block Obama's nominee uh, and blah, blah, blah. They don't care about the Bork situation back in Reagan's time and conveniently forgetting their own vocal support for judicial filibusters targeting Bush nominees. And we're not even going to go there, but um, ow, 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 ow. did I lie? Are we going there? <laughs> Um, uh, oh, hang on. Wow. Um, looking at the clock here. Mr. Producer, am I good to run over? You're fine. I'm fine. We're going to run over a few minutes. I'm sorry, dude. I know you're hungry. <laughs> but um, Chuck Schumer, uh, you know, he, he always delivers the goods, right? In July 2007, the New York Democrat gave a speech to a progressive legal society in which he said... This is about confirming a George W. Bush nominee in the last 18 months of his presidency. We should reserve or, or, or we should reverse the presumption of confirmation. I shouldn't run over. Uh, Schumer told the American Constitution Society Convention in Washington, the Supreme Court is dangerously out of balance. We cannot see Justice John Paul Stevens replaced by another Chief Justice John Roberts or Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg by another Samuel Alito.
Schumer went on to say that he would recommend to his Senate colleagues that we should not confirm any Bush nominee to the Supreme Court except in extraordinary circumstances. Mr. Schumer and the media may want to forget this as he insists on replacing Justice Antonin Scalia this year, but there it is. Schumer said he would do everything in his power to deny Bush an additional appointment to the high court in a speech delivered in the middle of 2007. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And as always, folks, don't take my word for it. Do your own homework. And as Hillary would say, Arf, arf, arf. Arf, 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 arf. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for me, everybody. Have a great Wednesday night. Stick around two hours. Rowdy Robinson comes on with a bear off the rails. You're going to want to tune in for it. I think it's going to be something special. Uh, and I don't mean special in a way that you can get rid of too real slowly or anything like that. I just think that the guy does a really great job. Uh, and if you're not like me and you can run up hours, I highly recommend this program. I just catch it on the replay the next day. He knows I love him, but I have to go to bed and get up early. So anyway, it is what it is. If you like the show, tell your friends. If your friends like the show, you probably need new friends. But you and they are always welcome every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on the Conservative Curmudgeon Show right here on K98. God bless you. We'll see you next week. We believe in the American way. And we built this country called the USA. And we fly our flag because we're proud and free. We're Americans. I'll tell you, I get no respect. None at all. All now. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. We're ready for our Four Seasons sunroom, and Daddy's going to get a rec room with refreshments. Oh, no. We'll be sleeping under the stars. Mom, what about the one with, you know, the fun? Nice try, little bro. It's a gym. My gym. Hey, Grandma's getting her Four Seasons garden room. Weather tight and still like being outdoors. Maybe a living room. Oh, no, wait. A family hub. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what the budget, the season, or the climate, Four Seasons Sunrooms let you and your family enjoy the outdoors inside. Call now to receive your free, no-obligation brochure from the premier manufacturer of sunrooms since 1975. More reasons for Four Seasons Now. To find out more, call toll-free 800-928-7007. That's 800-928-7007. Call 800-928-7007 today.